for your traditional lunch time. So we'll give um, folks just a few more minutes to dial on and we'll get started. Um, my name is uh, Linda Vasquez. I'm with the Campaign for College Opportunity. Um, today, we are gonna be walking you through some of the major changes to California University admissions as a result of the coronavirus. Let me be clear that I'm not an admissions representative um, on behalf of any of our public and private um, university systems, but we have done um, our best to capture all of the changes that have come from the different segments in an, in an attempt to provide you with the latest information about those changes and how you can inform your constituents, whether those are students and parents. Um, but first, let me share a little bit about the Campaign for College Opportunity. Um, I do see a lot of familiar faces uh, registered and participating in this call, but I also see a lot of well, not faces, names, but I also see a lot of new names. So welcome. Um, let me share a little bit about the Campaign for College Opportunity, if this is your first time joining us for a conversation. Um, the campaign is a broad-based coalition. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are a research and policy advocacy org that is dedicated to ensuring that every student who wants to go to college has a real opportunity to do so. Um, and our core focus is to influence um, policies through the state budget, system-wide policies, or the state legislature to expand college access. We support the scaling of student support programs and services that are really instrumental to helping them succeed and achieve their ultimate dream of earning a college degree. Um, and we also fight to dismantle structural inequities that are keeping our brilliant and talented students from earning a college degree. Um, as one of the state's leading racial equity advocates, uh, we want to ensure that our vulnerable students are not left behind in any of the, you know, policies that are shaping in light of coronavirus. And so this includes weighing in on the potential impacts to freshman admissions, transfer pathways, and the financial aid availability that will um, be offered offered to our students, especially our disproportionately impact students, and that includes our low-income students, Latinx, Black, Native American, and on peace students. But let me start off by saying this, um, and you've probably heard this many times in week six or seven that we are in working from home or in quarantine that um, we are living in uncertain times and most everyone on this call either works directly with students or works with an institution or, a, or an organization that works directly with students. Um, and I'm almost certain that most of us did not take a crash course in our undergrad or grad programs that prepared us for the kinds of decisions that we need to make in support of student success while also preserving and, and make, you know, protecting their health and their safety. Uh, like there's no, there's no right way to prepare for a global pandemic. Um, there's no playbook for how to best respond to these issues. But you know, I want to recognize that there have been extraordinary efforts led by our college leaders, our faculty, our staff at both the K-12 and the higher ed systems, as they work, and they're working nonstop to support students. And I just hope that they. Um, they continue to find you know a balance to maintain their own um, health and well-being and that they could find some sleep at night because these are difficult times so I, I do before we go into the um the overview of the admissions changes just on behalf of the campaign for college opportunity extend our appreciation and our gratitude for the work that they're leading they really are frontline workers um, in rapidly responding to the changes that need to happen um, in response to the coronavirus and adapt accordingly and swiftly. Um, you, you've probably heard, and we're gonna cover this, but just in like a matter of weeks, our schools have transitioned tens of thousands of courses online, have supported um, to the best that they can hundreds of thousands of students to virtual instruction. I'm including the UC, the CSU, our community colleges, our private institutions, and of course, certainly our K-12 schools. So um, again, I wanna extend our appreciation for their work um, in the middle of a crisis because the reality is that we are in the middle of a crisis and I don't think anyone is attempting to replace brick and mortar through this new shift, but the reality that we should, you know, 
are, you know, there is this need to continue instruction, but in a virtual way and how you do that to give you props and how you're doing it for your respective communities and constituents. Our hope through today's webinar um, is not only to share information about the changes that have been made to admissions. This, you know, we're not going to cover grading policies at K-12 or grading policies at our colleges and universities only as they relate to admissions. But our hope is that, again, that you can relay this information to your students and families, the groups that you are work with, that you work with but also that as advocates, you know, we're also here to be a partner to strengthen any gaps in communication or gaps in addressing policies that need to be made to support our disproportionately impacted students. For starters, um, you know, our education segments have provided a joint statement on the five key issues they have agreed to reevaluate financial aid award packages based on need, especially for those students and families who have lost a job as a result of the coronavirus. There's, gonna, there's agreement on being flexible in grades for entering freshmen and transfer students. There's flexibility on the testing requirement, the standardized tests, SAT and the ACT, um, in submitting transcripts, and also flexibility in the dual enrollment um, course offering and students who are participating. This has been an agreement on behalf of the California, you know, the Department of Education, California Department of Ed, our independent private colleges and universities, the California Community College System, the Cal State System, and the UC System. But what we're going to go through today is that even though there is agreement to be flexible and all these things, there is still wide discretion and flexibility of how this looks by campus. And we're talking about 100 you know, over almost 150 public colleges and universities and 70 plus independent private colleges and universities. So that's something for us to consider as there is, you know, broad, you know, flexibility in how the institutions approach this, these decisions also have an impact to our students and how we communicate this to our students. I'm going to cover a lot of information, so bear with me here, um, and I'm going to walk you through some of the main elements of um, the changes that have been made. Let me start off by going over freshman admissions and how the UC, the Cal State, and the independent colleges and universities have adapted their requirements to submit um, transcripts. So. For the Cal State, for the UC system and the Cal State, they have July um, deadlines. For the UC, their deadline is July 1st. For the Cal State, it's July 15th. And both have said that they are going to be given to the best, you know, if, if at all possible, they're asking students to submit their official transcripts by those deadlines. But neither system is going to rescind their offer to the student for failure to meet those deadlines. Um, at the UC, students are going to retain their admission status for the first day of class until an official transcript has been an official transcript has been provided. At the Cal State, that also applies. They are going to ensure that the students retain their um, you know their admission status or their offer until the first day of class. Um, and the Cal State has actually stated that each campus has the flexibility to determine on a case by case basis. Um, that if the student is unable to provide an official transcript because their campus has been closed or they're unable to get in contact with their um, high school to provide those official transcripts, then each of the Cal State campuses can determine whether they're going to allow students to utilize an unofficial transcript or self-reported transcript data. For the independent colleges and universities, um, they will accept unofficial transcripts from students until the high school can submit an official one, although in our research we haven't um, found that they have given a definitive date, but they have broad flexibility in what that date looks like by campus. AP exams, I'll just go quickly over this. Nothing really changes. These are the same dates that the AP, um, the, you know, the, the campuses have for submitting those college board AP exam results. Um, only that the independent colleges and universities are going to maintain flexibility of those AP and IB classes and how they're going to weight their scores. 
On deferred admissions, all three systems have the same response that each campus is going to have its own procedure for how they consider and approve deferral requests. And again, this is a campus by campus approach. Um, I don't have any information other than what's listed here. Um, I understand that a lot of students may be thinking of deferring or deferring admissions um, or deciding not to enroll into a UC or Cal State or private college, wherever they were planning to attend after high school, especially if their financial circumstances have changed and may opt to enroll in a community college. You know, we encourage you to you know, look up um, the in individual campus website to find out what that referral policy is, especially if their, family, their families has been personally impacted by coronavirus um, and has lost, um, you know, a family member has lost their job and their family income has significantly changed. So this might, you know, change their decision on which institutions to enroll based on their um, affordability. On the requirement to submit a standardized test, the UC and the Cal State have already announced that they are temporarily suspending the requirement for um, fall 2021 admissions. So current juniors are not required to take this test and they won't be penalized when they apply in fall 2021 if they were not able to take the test. Now Cal State has provided additional clarity that this not only applies for those applying for fall 2021, but also for those who are applying in fall in winter and spring terms uh, the following year. You're starting to see a pattern here with the uh, response that, that independent colleges and universities are providing that really their, um, their requirement is going to vary by institution. Some institutions will waive the test altogether and others will provide flexibility in their scores if they've already taken. And it's, you know, it's, I think it's important to know um, that as it stands, um, no tests are happening. Like the, S, the college board and the ACT are not administering any tests for the foreseeable future. I have seen in the news um, here and there that you know the ACT has some plans for administering them in August or September. I think it's safe to say that um, segments and families should just take this you know month by month as a situation evolve, evolves. But the UC and the Cal State approaches that um, these tests are going to be um, not administered until you know indefinitely until um, they are going to be. Uh, stopped indefinitely and uh, because of that students applying for fall 2021 and into spring terms for 2022 aren't required to take it. Grading policies, now this applies you know, to um, high school students and the Cal State and the UC have the same response that they are temporarily suspending the letter grade for ADG courses completed um, this year for winter, spring, and summer. And this applies, and you see here, this applies for those admitted freshmen and all students who are enrolled in high school who may be applying for fall 2021, 2022, and 2023. The information that we've gathered for the independent colleges and universities just says that they are gonna be providing modifications to their policies on pass, no pass. Um, and how those classes are translated into GP and actual GPA is going to vary by institution. Now, this might be a question that a lot of you might have or weighing on the minds of many students right now um, is when it, when the deadline is to um, submit their statement of intent as it stands. The, the UC um, has the May 1st deadline to submit their statement of intent, but they have indicated that they're giving, you know, discretion to the institutions to determine if they want to extend that. Uh, they want to provide maximum flexibility to students who request it and who also request a deferment of a deposit that have already been made. Again, if they decide that they do not want to enroll in this fall, um, in this fall term. Um, and at the Cal State, they don't have a defined date. What they are doing is giving the decision up to each of the 23 campuses to, to, to determine when that deadline is. Um, and students and families are encouraged to contact each of the admissions office to find out what their options are. Same with the independent colleges and universities. 
I'm gonna pause here, not for questions, but just to remind um, you that you can enter your questions um, in the chat box. Um, my colleagues, Sarah Mooney and Jocelyn Correa are doing their best to answer the questions as they're coming in. We will have a section towards the end where you can ask questions um, and I will do my best to answer them. But there, this is a large group and I, um, it's always a challenge to answer them all. So as we go along, feel free to type in your question and both Sarah and Jocelyn will answer as we go along. So what does this mean for trans for students? The UC and the Cal State have indicated that these are the deadlines for transfer students to submit their, their official transcripts. And you'll see that these are the same deadlines that apply to freshmen. Um, same, no student is gonna be, um, you know, has, is gonna have their offer rescinded as a result of not meeting those deadlines, but they are still asking if at all possible to submit the official transcripts on time. Um, and uh, Cal State students are going to be, um, you know, will have their um, admissions offer. Um, they are going to be um, remain conditionally admitted until those final transcripts are received and reviewed. Again, with independent colleges and universities, those deadlines are going to vary. They all decide whether they can accept an official transcript from students um, until their their high school or I mean their college can provide an official one. For deferred admissions, you see that this chain, you know virtually remains unchanged for um, transfer students as it is for freshmen. Grading policies. Now these are important to note. Um, the UC has agreed to temporarily suspend the unit cap on the number of transferable units a student can give with past and old pass grades and that are applied to the minimum 60 um, semester or 90 quarter units for, required for junior standing. And the Cal State is gonna accept credit, no credit in lieu of the letter grades in the Golden Four category and Gen Ed or the prereq courses that are completed in the winter, spring, and summer. I am hearing that some campuses at the Cal State level are opting to provide a letter grade. And if they are providing a, wind, a brief window after that letter grade is administered to give students the final decision on whether they wanna accept the letter grade or they wanna instead accept a credit, no credit. So all the segments do have a policy for accepting a pass, no pass, or a credit, no credit, if that is what the individual community colleges decide to do. For the Cal State um, and the students who are community colleges, students who are transferring with an ADT, for those who anticipate completing an associate degree for transfer, and they were planning to enroll fall 2020, um, and they end up not completing those, AD, those ADT units um, and they have matriculated with at least 60 units completed. Um, if there are some of those classes that they fail to complete, um, they would need to obtain a special advising agreement um, by the individual CSU campus of which they plan to enroll to get a waiver or to find out what their alternative options are. So for those community college representatives on the line and they have questions about what this means for ADT transfer students to the Cal State, um, your best bet is to coordinate directly with the admissions office of the individual Cal State. Again, this is a statement of intent to register applies very similar to freshmen, although the UC deadline for the transfer students is June 1st, not May 1st. And what the Campaign for College Opportunity has been asking of our systems is that they extend the this statement of intent register date to all students to June 1st. May 1st is you know, just a little over a week, I'm losing track of my days, but it is not far off. And I can imagine that a lot of students and families are facing some angst right now about what their next steps are and their options if the deadline to submit their statement of intent to register is around the corner. Again, they do provide maximum flexibility to those families who need an extension, but we are calling on all of the segments to provide at least a June 1st deadline for both transfer students and freshman applicants or freshmen um, so that they have some more time to consider their options.
So a brief overview on financial aid. Um, and I, think, I think the bottom part is cut off, but I'll do my best to pull it up. So um, at the community college end, there's gonna be no impact to eligibility or a penalty uh, for promise grant recipients if they're unable to complete their coursework in that semester. And I think many of you may know that um, the college grants do have like a unit requirement in order to remain, um, to retain that grant. But um, the community colleges are encouraging students to contact their local campus financial aid office to determine if there are any other requirements or any other flexibility offered for them to retain those grants. Now, the College Promise program is different than the Promise Grant. Um, students that are typically not eligible for other types of aid may also be available, eligible for a waiver of enrollment fees. This is just the promise grant program or the promise program is only to waive their enrollment fees if they qualify as you see here as first time first year first year first time students. Um, the colleges are encouraging students to contact their individual uh, financial aid office to determine if um, they need to uh, um, if there are any other requirements for for them to waive their fees. Although I'm already hearing from community colleges across the state that they, um, uh, that they are gonna ensure that um, students' fees are all you know, waived for the summer and the fall courses. And even for those who um, paid for their courses this spring semester, I'm not sure if you're hearing this from the students that you work with now, but they're already getting refund checks for their courses, even if they decide to continue enrolling in that class to the end of the semester, that are, they are already getting refunds for the courses. On the Cal Grants, the California Student Aid Commission hasn't issued guidance to date on those changes to the Cal Grant eligibility, um, but Jocelyn can drop a link in the chat box that can take you directly to the, Cal, um, to the CSEC website where you can find additional information about forthcoming announcements. The Student Success Completion Grant, uh, what the community colleges have indicated is that those students must be taking either 12 or 14 units at the time of payment. And if the student reduces the number of units, um, even after they've paid them in light of Corona, there's gonna be no impact for that term or the following terms for uh, um, retaining that grant. The UC is encouraging, you know, the individuals, the families to contact their financial aid um, website for more information. And the UC has actually done a phenomenal job in providing contact information for staff that's working remotely. So you can imagine, like many of us, schools are, schools are closed and, you know, the staff is working remotely. And what does that phone number look like when you have a number of financial aid staff have, you know, um, working in different places? So you know, go to the different UC uh, website to find out the information for the financial aid contact. Um, I don't believe that the Cal State um, offers, you'd have the, um, I don't know to the extent that the Cal State offers that yet, but I know that the UC ins it has ensured that there's contact information for all staff in the financial aid office. And the UC, um, just like the Cal State, has indicated that they are going to be providing flexibility in financial aid award packages if a family member's financial circumstances have changed as a result of COVID. Um, and the UC is going to be working with families over the summer to review that financial aid package and their eligibility. The um, Cal State system um, has not announced any across the board system-wide announcements about what this means for financial aid award packages, but as you see here, eight of the campuses have already announced plans to delay the deposit deadlines. Again, this is really important if a family member, if a student has not yet decided if they're going to enroll in the institution in the fall or their financial circumstances have changed. Independent colleges and universities are going to be evaluating their financial aid award package um, on a case by case basis and um, they are also encouraged to to reach out families are encouraged to reach out to the in individual financial aid offices to determine what their options are.
Now, specific to undocumented students, well, before I go to the slide, Sarah and Jocelyn, I'm not checking the chat box, but feel free to um, chime in here. Let me know if there's anything I should flag or if I should pause. For undocumented students, the California Community Colleges has compiled a list of resources for undocumented students um, to help them navigate this time. And, um, you will all get a copy of this PowerPoint afterwards, in addition to you know, PDFs and other resources we've found from all of the segments. But they have a, a website dedicated um, for undocumented students and service providers to ensure that our undoc students are aware about the financial aid and uh, um, financial aid and resources available to them. But just like all other issues, um, the community colleges are encouraging the students to find you know reach out to their financial aid office for um, additional questions and details, and especially to find out about scholarships that may be available to them and emergency aid. I'm going to just power through these next couple of slides. We could not find specifics around um, accommodations or flexibility and financial aid awards for undocumented students at the UC, but it is important to note that at the UC, which does have legal service centers um, at each of the campuses, well, nine of the 10 campuses, those services remain open um, and available for a uh, appointment virtually and the reason why we we dropped this in is because um, you've probably seen the news from the Department of Education the undocumented students and DACA students have been omitted from the you know CARES Act funding and for some of our colleges, they were expecting millions of dollars, millions of dollars and 50% of those dollars was expected to go directly to students. And the colleges could determine how that aid could be utilized through emergency aid to expand support programs for students and to omit undocumented students from that aid is a devastating blow, knowing that the financial need is great. So, um, and you also know that we are in the middle of Supreme Court, not we, but the Supreme Court is in the middle of discussing the future of the DACA program. And if it turns out that they come down with a devastating decision to rescind DACA. Um, right now, a lot of organizations are mobilizing to um, get, uh, have a DACA recipients renew their permits. And if they or a family member has lost their job as a result of COVID coronavirus, um, the need for legal services is great. The need to seek legal counsel to determine what their options are to renew their permit whether support may be available to them is great. So having these services open is absolutely essential. And I understand that the Cal State system has partnerships with local legal service clinics um, that are gonna continue to provide those resources for students. The community college, although I don't have it on here, I'm happy to send it to you after this webinar. Um, there are a number of what they call hubs, like legal service hubs that are provided to community college students throughout the state. Now, I don't have the details, so I don't wanna misquote, but I can look into what um, the community colleges are doing to ensure that those services remain open via telephone or Zoom for students. I'm happy to provide that information for you. You see here that financial aid specific to undocumented students is, you know, the guidance from the Cal State in uh, independent colleges and universities is the same. They are encouraging students and families to reach out to the campus financial aid and scholarships office for um, resources and options. That was a lot to cover and I condensed it significantly. So what I'd like to do afterwards and let you know that we are gonna be creating um, a Google Drive where all of these announcements um, and changes are gonna be housed and um, also additional resources that you may wanna look into for your students around scholarships and um, legal services. So we'll make sure to drop that in so you can review the details. Um, I also wanna mention that these updates I feel like happen on a what sometimes feels like a daily basis or a weekly basis. So while we will share this PowerPoint tomorrow or next week, there may be changes to these policies and we'll do the best we can to continue updating you accordingly. 
just through this, you know, scan of the issues that have been addressed by the systems, the issues that have not been you know, addressed by the, our systems, there are just, you know, a couple of things for us to consider as challenges um, is that there is still a lot of flexibility and inconsistency across the, across the segments. So this seems to be resting a lot on the uh, campus by campus approach and how they determine revised financial aid award packages, how they determine deadlines to submit documents, how they determine um, uh, you know, the flexibility and utilization in grades um, to GPA. And this sends I recognize that this is difficult to convey uh, uh, messages to your students and families when there is really, you know, broad, there's wide variation in how um, the campuses are gonna approach the different admissions policies. It's, it's difficult to just tell your student and their families, well, call the, con call the financial aid office or just call, you know, the onus seems to be placed on the students and families to find out more information. Okay, so if we are asking families and students to contact the individual campus for more information, and mind you, different offices in the campus, right? Scholarships office, financial aid office, admissions, um, that there needs to be a reliable, you know, place or a center place where students can access those contact, you know, the contact information, phone number, email, even as simple as just providing um, these updates on a website, there is lack of consistency in accessing this information by campus and even across the segments. I understand that the, um, the CSU and the UC and the community colleges have landing pages where they are um, you know, doing their best to share these updates, um, but not uh, to put these updates in a central place on the website, but we had to scour, scour through different websites to get this information for you. And so it is really important that our systems house all of this information in one landing page to provide ease of access for our students and our families. So um, I'm gonna transfer it over to my colleague, Sarah Mooney then um, now for us to walk through like, so what happens now, right? And how can I be engaged if you've listed you know, concerns of how um, these uh, admissions policies are being weighted or how they are, you know, the communication is being distributed to students and families, so what now? But one thing I wanna just flag for you that we, will, we are gonna continue to monitor these discussions and if, you are interested, we will continue to update you on these discussions. But knowing that the systems, um, the UC and the Cal State have temporarily suspended the requirement of the SAT and the ACT, the SAT and the ACT, it's always a tongue twister for me, those tests for admissions. One thing for us to consider for that freshman class is in lieu of those tests, what are they gonna be using? for admissions. Are they gonna be relying solely on A to G for um, our Cal States? Um, at the UC, there is a holistic approach where they weigh in 14 different factors. So even when you remove the SAT and the ACT, they have a comprehensive review approach where they weigh um, students, um, not only eligibility, but um, you know admissions to the university. How is that gonna look like for the Cal State when they've removed one of their you know main elements for admission? So those are things that we're gonna wanna consider and ensure that there is no um, direct impact to our students, that they're not placing more weight on a course, for example, like on a math and English course. And there is a similar to the UC, a holistic approach to reviewing admissions for that class. And with that, I transition it over to Sarah. All right, let's see. Can folks hear me okay? Yes, okay. Thanks, Marlon, <laughs> appreciate it. Thanks, Kat. Um, all right, hi, everyone. I am not actually on a beach. This is just positive visualization for this hot day in Los Angeles. Um, so Linda covered a lot of what we can do now, but um, I think before we get into some specifics, I, I just want to recognize and, and having met with a few of our um, Los Angeles-based partners and Inland Empire partners, 
in the last few weeks to recognize the stress and challenge that you all are feeling as school districts, as service providers, as, as parents of, of students, um, and that the students you know, these, this class of 2020 is feeling, or, or the transfer class of 2020 is feeling. Um, and it's frustrating, you know, to have to, Linda talked a little bit about this, but to call a financial aid office when you're already dealing with so much and to be told to, oh, just, it's a two hour wait because there's, the system is really swamped right now. So um, there's a lot of, of challenges and just patience that is required from our students and our families. Um, but also on the other side of that, because we need our systems to be much more unified, we need to see a lot more leadership from our systems levels in terms of clear, consistent communications, um, and also towards more student-centered approaches to admissions. We can't just leave this all up to chance right now. Um, and I also do want to touch on this uh, fear that some of us may have heard of students um, of declining enrollments, especially for our private universities, but also some of our four-year universities. Um, and I do want to emphasize that you all, as folks who ensure these students get to college and ensure that they enroll, um, you all hold a lot of power. Um, there are a number of opportunities for place-based partnerships and statewide partnerships to ensure that we're actually um, enrolling students at the rate that campuses need, because they depend on your students for um, income from the state. So I just want to put those two, this recognition that's out there, but also um, we all hold a lot of power to um, really push our campuses to do everything that they can um, to engage with students and families who are um, considering uh, applying to their campuses or, or going to their campus next year. Um, so uh, next slide, please, Ms. Linda. So um, Linda touched on this, but I think in the short term, um, we will continue to communicate with you about what's going on, but please, um, as service providers and counselors, um, find out what your local CSU and UC is doing. I know that there's been some flexibility and also a lot of ambiguity from the state, unfortunately, but there should be information as much as possible on these campuses' websites. Um, and also, we have a number of school districts and school system K-12 leaders on the call. Super excited that you all are here. But again, you can use and leverage your power um, to really voice needed flexibility for students. We're coming up on the statement of intent to register, and we still have not gotten a, a clear response from some of our system leaders. So voice the needs for flexibility when it comes to financial aid, when it comes to grading policies, and when it comes to students really making that decision um, for themselves for what their plans are for the fall. And also for school systems, you know, communication and over communication is key right now. Um, we welcome you sharing some of this information on your websites um, through your counseling networks, etc. Um, if you want to create your own or build off of some of what we've done, you know, this is a real opportunity for you all to, there's no shortage of communication right now for students and we encourage you all to do that not only on the websites, but also can you leverage social media? Can you leverage text messaging systems for your seniors and for your transfer students? So um, all of these pieces are really important in the short term, again, so we don't lose our students. Um, we know that there's a number of factors coming at them and uncertainty coming at them, but how much can you do to kind of assuage some of their fears and also put, um, put pressure on the system to create welcoming experiences and to communicate clearly with students, um, prospective students. I uh, also want to, in kind of the more statewide and longer term piece, um, join us in, in some system-wide board engagement. So again, there's been some efforts from the Partnership for LA Schools, as well as a network of students from across the three segments that we um, manage, the Heart Roundtable, um, to extend the statement of intent to register. So that's, a, that's kind of an immediate um, advocacy piece. And then also to demand streamlined communications to students across platforms and languages. We know many of our first gen students are having to translate information, whether it's around unemployment or financial aid for their parents right now. Um, so as much as we can have our systems 
taking it upon themselves to be much more um, conscious of who their customers are. So we welcome um, those pieces. All right, and I see some questions in the chat box. And I'll, um, so Linda, I have one question that was um, sent to me directly, and then I have an, a question from, uh, two questions from two different Catherines. Um, so we will, uh, I'll let you handle those. But I'll, well, Linda, I'll say the first question that I got via chat, and I would love your response to that, um, which was around if you can offer some clarification on what the golden four is. Oh, you're still on mute, Linda, so let me. Is that, okay, you should be off mute now. Yeah, the golden four, um, let me see, Jocelyn, are you there? Can you send the, okay, so someone's typing them and I wanna say that they are in like um, English, math, um, a science, and then the, like a communications class. But I don't, uh, also look, there's a written communication, it must be a counselor, oral communication, critical thinking, And math, yeah. So not a science, but it was uh, uh, around just, uh, again, a reminder. Thank you to Pam and the counselor, uh, I believe it was counselor Bertha, critical thinking, um, math and quant reasoning, reasoning, oral communications and critical thinking and uh, written communications, I'm sorry. All right. I love a good community response to a yeah. question. All right, and then I see other ones coming in. So, uh, Linda, is it helpful for me to read these off for you? Yeah, read them off for me. I do have the chat open, okay. but feel free to field um, whatever um, you think I can answer because, you know, I am not a financial Great. aid or admissions expert. <laughs> All right, we have another one from Catherine. How can we support efforts to advocate for flexibility for students? Can we connect our students to this effort? Yes, uh, great question. Um, we call on you to join us in um, upcoming efforts. Uh, one of them that may likely include attending virtually the CSU Board of Trustees meeting and the UC Regents who are meeting in a few weeks mid-May um, and providing public comment and asking them to extend their statement of intent to register to June 1st for all students. Now I recognize that that already comes after the May 1st deadline for freshman applicants at the UC. Um, but we can circle back with you. We are actively involved on social media, just asking our systems to extend that deadline. Um, our, Sarah mentioned that we convene a, a roundtable of student leaders from all of our statewide student organizations that includes the Cal State system, the UC, colleges, uh, the community colleges, and other student-led organizations like you Aspire and RISE, they have put together a letter outlining recommendations for our system leaders and how they can um, ensure that student needs are addressed in upcoming policies. This is one of them. Um, I think one way for you to help us um, join us in those efforts is to distribute that letter to your students, but also um, uh, make make phone calls and an email to the chancellor's office, both at the Cal State and the president's office at the UC, asking that they extend that deadline. Um, you may walk if you have a relationship with any of the members of the board of trustees. We can send you a link of who those members are. We encourage you to send them a note. They they are the ones that are also making important decisions about these policies, encouraging them to extend that deadline. Um. Um, Kat Trejo asked about a social media toolkit for our advocacy. We don't have a social media toolkit um, for this, but um, there is a, let me show you our, our social media account. Um, there's Sarah and I. You should see our Facebook, um, our Twitter and our Instagram handles there. Um, we will post announcements, we'll post articles, we'll post ways that you can get involved on social media. If there is, right now we don't have it, but there, if there is an advocacy plan 
Um, and it'll be a time sensitive one because we're approaching May, the May 1st deadline. If there is a plan of action where we may put together, say, a letter of concern or a social media toolkit directed at our system leaders, um, uh, we will let you know and how you can be involved in that. Um, I think what we've done already is put together that uh, heart letter outlining the students' concerns, and that has been submitted to our system leaders for consideration. We've invited those leaders to a conversation that student leaders are hosting May 8th um, to engage in a dialogue about those recommendations. So if there's an interest of any of your organizations to join us for that call, again, it'll happen May 8th um, in the afternoon. I don't have a time in front of me, but if you're interested in joining that call, we can share those details with you. All right, and then another one from Catherine around the delay in the financial aid offers, and I'm not sure if we have um, insight to this, but if schools can, will consider extending the statement of intent to register deadlines to allow students to consider those financial aid offers, especially if there's a delay. Um, and can we advocate for students to receive financial aid offers before the 5-1 deadline? Um, since not all campuses have offered the uh, intent to register um, extension. Sorry, I'm reading the question because I was uh, like an echo and I missed the first part. Many students are experiencing delays in financial aid offers. As we get closer to the May 1st deadline, will schools consider extending those SIR deadlines to allow students more time? Can we advocate for students to receive financial aid offers before? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the reasons why we're asking for the extension of the, um, of the deadline to submit a statement for, um, of intent to register. We wanna provide families with the, of that additional flexibility. And I'm also under, um, hearing that by campus by campus, some, fam some families won't be given a, a final financial aid award package until they submit the statement of intent to the individual university. So we're asking for greater flexibility. Um, well, that's why we're asking for the extension by the campuses to submit the statement of intent to register. I think in the interim, all I can say is that um, what the systems have been doing, what, what the systems have outlined is that each family is encouraged to contact the financial aid office to find out what their options are. I'm gonna ask for maximum flexibility um, for that family to provide a revised financial aid award package. Wonderful. If they All right, have, we have two more. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if, uh, they're, if their income has changed in light of COVID, I think what um, families and, and students can do is just fight to at least include their EFC, their, um, that the institution can at least provide the families with their expected family contribution. Maybe not a final award package would be available for the families, but if at least the institution can give them their EFC, I think that alone, that alone could give the families some information to go off of to make a determination of whether they decide to enroll or not. All right, and we had a question around um, a family who's been impacted by COVID to ask for their aid to be reevaluated. So I think you just spoke to that, um, resubmitting your expected family uh, contribution. And then Miguel asked, um, are there engagements, has there been any engagement with K-12 school districts for support? Um, so. Linda, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I can give my two cents as well. You should, yeah. So I think what we've seen, there has been some um, state level conversations with Superintendent Tony Thurmond and the three section uh, leaders around this. But um, aside from kind of clarifying some of the deadlines and policies that Linda went through today, um, we're not, uh, there hasn't necessarily been a, a broad kind of communications plan beyond that. And um, so I think, again, it's, it's campus by campus. I think, you know, a lot of uh, networks in LA um, and some of our other partners, there's strong partnerships already between K-12 and higher ed. And I think this is one of those times where that infrastructure is incredibly helpful. Um, so if you all can leverage those uh, networks in your local area, um, that would now would be the time to do so because I don't believe that there's been any kind of shining example of um, partnerships for communications just as of yet. People have really been in kind of immediate response mode, but now is the time to, to talk about um, 
ensuring that students get through that already challenging transition right between uh, senior year and freshman year of college. Um, Sarah, I know that um, the financial aid questions are, there are a number of financial aid questions that have come in and um, we're doing the best that we can to answer them uh, uh, appropriately, but um, Audrey Dow is on the line and w can share a little bit more information about the financial aid questions that have come in. Can you unmute her? Hi everyone, uh, this is Audrey. It's great to be with all of you today. You know, I think building on what Linda Vasquez shared about, you know, this uncertainty on what a financial aid package might look like from the CSU and until a student commits, you know, in speaking with a few presidents of CSU campuses where that is their policy that they don't release um, financial aid packages until a student has committed, you know, most of the, the presidents do understand the changing times that we're in and are very, very much encouraging students to just, if that's the situation that they're in, they cannot commit until they understand what their financial aid package is, that they reach out immediately to the campus um, and state that that is their circumstance and that the campus will do its best to again, give you a guesstimate of what your aid package could look like. I do also suggest if you're counseling students to look at that estimated family contribution um, that you would have gotten when your FAFSA was submitted to get a sense of what you can expect um, as just the guiding point, but also again, asking the campus to say, hey, look, this is what I understand my EFC is. Can you give me a sense before I can make this a, a decision? One of the things that this crisis has exposed is so many of the uh, policy and procedural uh, barriers I, that already exist uh, in our higher ed systems. And I think this is one area, the fact that there are some campuses, you know, for this example, within the CSU that do not make financial aid awards known before a student commits is not how we should be doing admissions. Students need a lot more information to make uh, to make an informed decision about what they can afford and where they can go. And so we know that some campuses are really seeing that now and making commitments to change, but this should be a, a statewide, system-wide policy for our segments to give students that aid information well before they make their decisions. Thank you, Audrey. You know, we are um, close to wrapping up on time. I know that there have been a lot of questions around like how you can be involved and that makes me so excited of how you may, you may want to be in tune with the conversations we're going to have around these issues, how you bring in students into the conversation. Sarah and I lead our, um, our regional statewide partnership efforts or coalition efforts related to um, college access and there will be, uh, we will let you know if there are opportunities to weigh in on any of the issues that we've outlined here today. Sarah did a wonderful job outlining what you can do now as you inform your students and families regarding the changes to admission. But if, you know, we will, after this call, outline some next steps for you to be involved in the conversations with the CSU systems, um, the UC system, and also outlining how you can participate in that student-led conversation in a couple of weeks. Um, and again, if any of these changes, uh, if any of these policies change um, in the coming days or in the coming weeks, we will certainly keep you updated and our emails are here below. And with that, we are going to close. I wanna thank you not only for your time, but the work that you lead um, every single day. I saw a wide, um, you know, diver a lot of diversity in the voices represented in, in the call. And you are, work you know, as Sarah mentioned, you're a 
schools, you work for um, civil rights organizations, advocacy organizations, you may work for an educational institution. And I want to thank you for the work that you are leading and your, you know, your work to ensure that you are informed about these changes that are directly impacting students and families. Um, and thank you for contributing your time to join us today.